getting to grips with technology. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a webinar today on financing EV charging infrastructure. I'm James Larmore. In addition to badly needing a haircut, I'm also a partner at Free, specialising in capital projects. This is the second in a series of webinars we're having on all things EV related. We've got a further series of webinars coming up in the autumn, so please keep an eye out for those. Today I'm pleased we've got some really good speakers for you. We've got Joe Patrick from the leading Amber, uh, uh, from leading infrastructure fund manager, Amber Infrastructure. He's going to talk to us about the Mayor of London's Energy Efficiency Fund and the financing available from that fund for EV projects. We have Sterling Habits from Green Giraffe, who are financial advisors in the renewable energy sector. We'll look at a series of case studies of recent transactions. And then finally, we have Stefan Barrow from MUFG, one of Japan's largest financial institutions, who will look at some key financing issues for EV charging projects. Before I hand over to the experts, I'll take a look at some of the key risks in EV charge point projects and how these can best be managed to assist with financing. But before we get to good stuff, some housekeeping as usual. Uh, if you lose us, please click on the link in your invitation and that should enable you to go straight back into the webinar. Uh, we've turned off your microphone, so thankfully you can't heckle me. And we've also disabled your uh, video so you can sit back and relax. If you've got any questions, there should be a speech bubble function at the bottom of your screen, or at least I'm told there is. Um, and if you add your questions there, we'll try our best to answer them at the end of the session if we have enough time. If we run out of time, we will come back to you in the next few days, hopefully with an answer. And we're also recording the webinar, so we will circulate a link to our YouTube channel after the event so you can review it at your leisure. I'll just pop up some slides now. Okay, so just to kick off, I was going to take a look at some of the key risks in uh, EV projects from the perspective of investors and developers, as these will be fundamental to successfully financing any project. Uh, and I'm afraid it's a bit of a shameless plug here for our EV charging infrastructure risk matrix, which I'm sure many of you have already downloaded from our website. If you haven't, it is freely available, so please don't get a, go and get a copy. Um, essentially, we found that the EV market is very fast moving. Uh, it's very competitive. There's a number of players out there and there's a wide range of commercial models. And in that sense, it is a little bit chaotic. And to try and make some sense out of all of this, we went back to first principles and drew up a list of the key risks uh, in EV charging projects and worked through how best to allocate those between the parties. So the matrix uh, works through the key phases of a project, so that's pre-commencement, installation, the operational phase, and takes you through how best those, those risks might be allocated between the parties. So I thought it'd be helpful to have a quick tour of what, what the key risks are that the market's currently grappling with. So I'll run through those now. In some cases, there's no easy answers, but I'll hope to give you some, some food for thought. Um, perhaps no surprise, the single biggest risk uh, that is changing the market is demand risk. Um, the simple question here is, you know, is there sufficient demand for the charge points to make a project viable? Now, at the moment, clearly uh, the uptake of EVs is, is rather limited and uh, that is projected to grow, which is why we're all here really, isn't it? Um, but even if there is greater EV uptake, there is no guarantee that punters will come to your charge points once you've got them in the ground. How can you mitigate this? Well, site selection is obviously a key mitigating factor, but obviously that involves you putting an awful lot of faith in uh, feasibility studies, which, which, which are telling you that it's a good site which will attract customers. Other things to look at are captive markets uh, to manage demand risk out of a project. So for example, this could include charge points servicing a commercial fleet or perhaps taxis within a city centre. So charge points servicing taxis within a city centre. Another uh, potential structure is to look at additional revenue streams. So a good example of this is the electric forecourt model, which GridServe are promoting. And this is essentially co-locating charge points with retail, solar, and battery storage to provide other revenue streams to cross subsidize the charge points whilst the, the, the uptake of uh, EVs is in its infancy. And finally, one other 
another aspect to look at is if you are providing charge points in response to a, a procured project for a third party, it may be possible to negotiate availability uh, style payments to reduce the risk. The next issue to consider is defects and charge points. And the real issue here is there's likely to be a mismatch between the length of your project, the project term, and the warranty period offered by charge point manufacturers, which typically we're, we're seeing around three years for that. Additionally, manufacturers will look to limit their liability through liability caps and exclusions. And I think that what this means is that for, de for developers and investors, there will be an element of risk relating to defective charge points which sits with you. It may be possible to negotiate extended warranty periods, but invariably this does come with some cost. Another issue to consider is batch failures, uh, particularly batch failures which occur outside the warranty period. And we are aware that in other markets it has been possible to negotiate uh, an enhanced warranty to cover uh, that risk and the, the rationale really is if you have a batch failure then that's really indicative of a systemic failure on the part of the manufacturer and therefore notwithstanding their, their desire to, to minimize their risk that is that is something they should bear. Uh, ultimately I, I don't think this is a risk you can get away from completely. Um, as the market matures and, and people understand asset performance a little better it may be that technical due diligence can assist with this um, but ultimately I think you're looking at some kind of reserving mechanism to provide contingencies and perhaps as failure rates become better understood there can be some modeling behind that based on projected failure rates to give you some science to work out how much uh, reserving or contingency uh, you may need. The next issue is vandalism and customer misuse. I think this largely comes from the fact you're dealing with assets which are largely available to the public 24 7 on an unsupervised basis it may not be possible to put in place security measures to prevent vandalism um, okay you could put in some cctv or, or security patrols but th that's not going to be watertight the other issue of course is you've got the, you know the, the great british public using your assets so there could be uh, the risk of misuse or you can have poor drivers like me turning up reversing into your charge points uh, giving rise to damage again uh, you know this this is something you could model to see what the, the the chances of the risks are and and how much you should put aside to deal with it but the, the key uh, mitigant would seem to be insurance but i, I think insurance is probably going to be quite an interesting area in relation to charge points I'd be very keen to understand what the level of the deductible looks like as compared to the, the, the capex of the replacement of or repair of the assets and indeed how multiple claims could impact upon insurance premiums. Um, it may be that insurance isn't the, the, the complete solution. Change in law and regulatory risk. As we looked at in our last webinar, the law applicable to uh, EVs is very much in its infancy. The key piece of legislation is the Automated and Electric Vehicles Act 2018 and as Jason took you through last time this creates very much a, a legal framework which allows for further regulation through secondary legislation particularly around smart charging. Looking at the regulation of electricity supply I think it's fair to say that the regulatory regime is trying to catch up um, with EVs as the, the, the codes weren't designed uh, with EVs in mind. Helpfully, Ofgem has issued guidance that the supply of electricity to EVs is not a licensable activity. However, the supply of electricity to a charge point does require an electricity license. Taking all this into account, it seems to me that it's currently something of a light touch. And on that basis, uh, things could well change. Legislation can only go one way, uh, and particularly as, as the EV market develops and different business models appear, um, there could be more and more regulation coming down the pipes. Uh, all of the above is, is likely to have capex consequences, so again, some consideration needs to be given as to how that might be funded. And equally, uh, obsolescence, uh, we're all uh, aware of um, examples of cutting edge technology which uh, subsequently becomes obsolete. Uh, it is the early stages of the EV adventure 
uh, there's an obvious risk that that um, infrastructure procured today might soon become obsolete um, or indeed uh, uh, unattractive to customers and therefore uh, for from a performance perspective, let's say, and therefore that's going to have an impact upon revenue, which then obviously feeds into demand risk. So things to consider here, uh, technical advice uh, as to the longevity of, of the particular piece of infrastructure and also funding for the refresh of uh, kit down the line. And the final point I wish to touch on was the cost of electricity. Now, uh, charge point operators will be bearing the risk of fluctuations in uh, the cost of electricity. You could obviously pass that back to consumers, but that might not be the best strategy uh, in terms of engendering customer loyalty uh, and will that obviously have revenue implications. Also on publicly procured projects, we are aware that the public sector counterparties often look to impose some pricing controls uh, on, on their private sector uh, counterparties to, to, to ensure that um, the, the infrastructure is at a reasonable price for consumers. What can you do about this? Well, I think the key thing is having uh, an electricity procurement strategy. So you're really looking at a long-term uh, power purchase agreement. Uh, it is also important to ensure that you're procuring green energy uh, Clearly a fossil fueled powered EV is not a good look and kind of counterproductive. Um, and then finally, um, consider co-location of storage and generation assets with a view to reducing uh, the cost of electricity. Uh, that's all I wanted to say today on, on risks in um, EV projects. Um, all of these risks and more are, are detailed in our risk matrix. And if you'd like to have further discussion with us around that, please do get in touch. Um, so now I'll hand over to Joe Patrick, but before I do that, we'll have a poll question. Which is popping up now. And now I'll hand over to Joe Patrick from Amp Infrastructure. He's going to talk to us about the Mayor of London's Energy Efficiency Fund. Morning everyone, I hope you can see my slides. Um, there we go. Um, thank you, James. Um, hi everybody, um, my name's James. Joe, Patrick. you might want to pop it into slide view, perhaps. Sorry. I have I not done that? Down there. Oh. That should have done that, has that not worked? That's okay, we'll just go with it, Jay. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, hi, my name's Joe Patrick. Um, I work for an organisation called Amber Infrastructure. Um, we are a large um, infrastructure investor, fund manager and asset manager. And I suppose through the um, relationships we've had with the public sector, um, over time we have become the fund manager for various um, funds for different arms of government um, across the UK, um, England, Scotland and, and now into Europe. Um, and this slide just demonstrates those funds. Um, the fund that I'd love to talk to you about today is the Mayor of London's Energy Efficiency Fund. Um, the reason really twofold that I want to mention that today is one that the Mayor of London's Energy Efficiency Fund um, can actually um, fund EV projects and I'll be able to demonstrate to you the breadth of projects that it can invest in. Um, and two, I think um, hopefully of interest for particularly the public sector and local authorities, um, and please do feel free, free to follow up with me after on this. Um, it's a really interesting model. Um, the reason it is a really interesting model from my perspective is that um, it allows quite a quick um, defrayal of monies into the low carbon sector. Um, we're incentivized to do as many projects as we can, provided that we hit the criteria that the mayor has asked for. 
Um, and what's interesting about the way that we do it is we're not actually just giving out grant to those projects, we're giving out competitive finance. Um, so they're not grant led projects, they're actually a mixture of predominantly debt, but some equity as well. Um, so please do feel free to contact me through Freeds if you'd like to speak about that further and I can give you a bit more information on how the fund works, how it was procured um, and what I see the benefits from the public sector perspective are. So very quickly, um, here we go. So this is a bit about MEEF. Um, so MEEF um, was... Right, Joe, I, I, sorry to chat, I was stuck on slide one still, I think. I think if you click on the enable editing tab at the top of your PowerPoint. Hang on a minute, sorry. Yeah, there we go. That's it. But now, uh, hang on a minute. So can you see Mayor of London's energy efficiency? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah, we've sorry, still got the... Don't worry. Okay. Um, so yes, so the Mayor of London's Energy Efficiency Fund was set up about two years ago by the GLA um, who went through, we went through a, a long procurement process and, and were awarded the fund manager. The idea behind the Mayor of London's Energy Efficiency Fund, which I'll go on calling MEEF now, um, is that it provides a flexible and competitive funding source to projects, both in the public and private sector to try and um, kickstart projects that might not ordinarily be able to get funding. Um, it can provide funding to all sorts of sectors. So we can offer funding to the registered providers, not-for-profits, health, local authorities, um, all fields of education. And then as I mentioned, um, to the private sector. And if it's in the private sector, it's to SMEs. Um, the, the MEEF does provide low cost um, projects, well, sorry, finance to um, all sorts of technologies. So if you look on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see it's very, very broad. And I think that that is actually a, a really good thing of this fund is that actually technologies are changing the whole time. So we need to have that breadth. So anything to be perfectly honest that fits within the low carbon arena um, is within the fund, but it would be probably fair to say that the majority of our funding to date has been in the energy efficiency um, decentralized energy um, and probably the energy storage space um, and more recently electric vehicle charging. Um, the way that the MEEF works is that we're able to offer very long-term finance um, to the borrower. Um, at the moment this is up to 18 years because the fund is a 20-year fund um, and what we can also do is we can allow the borrower to draw down as and when they need the funds so they don't need to draw down all the money at once. Um, another advantage um, which does help the public sector in particular at times is we appreciate that the public sector um, are highly resource constrained and so we do a lot of the due diligence work with them, help them with their business cases and help them get those projects um, over the line. James, can I just check in with you that you can see the slide investment criteria? Uh, so no, your slides aren't moving, Joe. I think actually, you see the top of your screen says enable editing. I think if you click on that, I haven't got that button. Have you not? That's no. what we're seeing currently. Actually, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you know it says notes in the bottom right hand corner. Hang on a sec. This is very weird. Let's let's do it this way. Can you see it now? Yeah, that's great. Oh, hang on. Sorry, everybody. Let me just go back and share the screen again. Okay, can you see now? I'll assume you can. Okay, so this is a bit about the investment criteria for me. So um, we need to make sure for every project that for every £7,000 of GLA funds that are invested, the project saves a tonne of carbon. And if it's an energy efficiency project, we need to make sure that there is a 20% energy project um, and the project does need to be in London. Um, the MEEF targets projects from about three million to 20 million pounds, but it would be fair to say that the most recent deals that we've done in the EV sector um, are more about the million pound mark. Um, the investment period runs till 2023, 
So whilst the project doesn't need to be completed by 2023, we need to get the money out to the borrower by that date. So what can MEF fund? Um, MEF can fund in the EV space, um, I think pretty much everything. Um, so the charging point infrastructure, any related grid upgrades, any renewables if you're going down the grid serve type route, um, including the canopies, any civil works, planning costs, and then if you're a fleet, we can actually fund the um, electric vehicles. So we're looking into a number of projects at the moment for some of London's fleets. Um, there are two ways in which MEF um, can fund EV projects. Um, so the first is we could on-lend the money from the MEF direct to the EV charging operator. So on the left hand side of this slide, this is perhaps the detail that sits behind the MEF. So MEF is predominantly made up of monies from the GLA. And this is in the form of ERDF monies. So that's monies from the European Regional Development Fund. As part of the procurement, we were asked to um, go out and crowd in a number of additional banks so that those monies could sit alongside the GLA monies. So in the top hand block, you'll see monies from um, five different financial institutions that sit alongside the GLA monies. And then in addition, um, Amber, so Amber has skin in the game, has also put in um, some contingent monies. And what we do on a project by project basis is we go out and we run a mini funding competition of those financial organisations. And then we take forward um, the funding from the institution that wins that funding competition. And we match the GLA monies with those monies. And then we on lend that competitive um, loan to the EV charging operator and then the EV charging operator can spend that money on the eligible expenditure for their project. So that's the first way of doing that. Obviously in that instance we are looking at repayment risk from the EV charging operator, generally an SME, so we have to take that into account um, when we are coming up with the interest rate on our loan. The second way of doing it is in the next slide, which hopefully you can see. Um, which is where we actually on lend to the public sector counterparty, so that might be a local authority, and then that local authority on lends that money to the EV charging operator. From the MEF perspective, in this instance, generally speaking, the rate of interest that we can offer the public sector counterparty would be lower than the rate of interest that we can offer an SME, because to a degree, we're largely looking at the credit risk of the public sector entity rather than the SME. Um, this is a very quick one run through of the MEF application process. Um, as I mentioned before, we're very, very keen to hold the hands of our projects and take them through this process with us. Um, we are obviously looking after the purse of public monies, so it is a very sort of rigorous, um, well, well sort of tested um, governance procedure. It's based on a two stage credit approval process whereby the first stage, we actually screen the project, discuss the project with the um, potential borrower um, and come up with a set of heads of terms for which we want to lend them the money. We then go to our first stage credit approval and get approval for that. We then enter into the due diligence phase, which is largely us doing our technical due diligence to check that the project saves the carbon and then to um, finalize a standard form loan agreement and then we go back to our credit committee for a decision to invest. After that, the project can then draw down the cash and then we come in a year after practical completion just to make sure that the project has been built and that the money hasn't been spent on a shiny new car. So that's that. Um, key considerations for me for an EVDR, I mean, to be honest, a number of these have been mentioned by James um, before. But key things that we look at are the asset life. We look at the residual value um, of both the vehicles and the charging infrastructure. Um, and then we look at the potential loan life that we can give to um, the borrower. I suppose coming back to James's point, again, this feeds into what warranties can be provided. And if we can't get comfortable that the warranties are long enough, um, you'll see at the bottom what we look to, 
um, ask borrowers to do is actually reserve some funding um, to life cycle the kit later on once those warranties have expired. We also look closely at the counterparty risk, um, i.e. whether it's an SME that we're lending to versus um, a local authority or another public sector entity with um, a very good credit risk. We also look at the security package, which may be on offer um, largely on small SME type projects. We would look for some parental support. Um, and I think the other thing that is interesting in all these projects is, is what happens on termination. We do um, need to gain some comfort that in a, in a termination scenario, um, our debt will be repaid. Um, as James mentioned previously, um, obviously um, debt providers like the certainty of an availability type payment and they like the certainty of a long con contract term. Um, again, we can, we can provide me funding to most types of structure, but what, what these two things will do is probably provide a longer tenor on the loan plus a lower interest rate over the time. And then finally, um, this is a recent SME project that we've done in London. Um, we've done this um, during lockdown, so it was pretty impressive that actually um, the SME managed to get this over the line. And um, there was quite a lot of blood, sweat and tears, I can tell you over this one, but it's a really great project. Um, we have provided finance to install the charging infrastructure at a bus depot in London um, for a bus operator. Um, it wasn't a huge loan, um, but I think what it did achieve from our perspective um, was actually coming up with a structure that we feel that could be um, very easily repeated um, and, and done again. And so what we've done is get up that learning curve this time round and we'll use it hopefully on, on further deals. The other thing that is absolutely great about this project is that overall the electric bus fleet will save over a thousand tonnes of carbon per year, um, which is about the equivalent of taking a thousand cars off London's roads. So a very, very quick um, whiz through the MEF. Um, do feel free to contact me directly if you've got any further questions on either the MEF structure or in particular um, what we can fund. Obviously the fund does go much wider than just EVs, but I just wanted to draw your attention to the EVs today. Um, many thanks. Thanks, Jay. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Can we have the next uh, poll question, please, while, before Sterling joins us? Sterling, you ready? Yes, thank you very much, James. <laughs> okay, so this is Sterling um, Habits from Green Giraffe. Thank you, Sterling. I'm just looking at my video to see if I can start this. There we go. Uh, I think I need the host to start my video for me. Ah, yes, I'm on. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, James, and hello, everybody. So um, my name is Sterling Habits. I work for an organization called Green Giraffe. Green Giraffe is a, a financial advisory firm um, focusing on renewable energy primarily. But very briefly, we have about 100 professionals across six countries. Uh, we focus on wind farms and solar projects and also more recently electric vehicle charging. And we're, um, we have Daiwa, the major Japanese conglomerate, as one of our key shareholders. So. I'm going to take a few minutes to run through a few case studies of, um, of, of financing of electric vehicle charging projects. I've got three case studies that I want to run through um, and I'll briefly explain these three. The, the first one is uh, electric vehicle charging for um, a, 
a retail. In this case, it's a case study with supermarkets. The next one is a case study with uh, taxi fleets, electric vehicle charging for taxi fleets. And then I, at, for the third one, I'm just briefly going to mention one of the larger electric vehicle charging transactions that's taken place to date, fin finance in, in Europe. Um, the key, a key aspect of any finance of electric vehicle charging infrastructure is how do you get your return on the finance, or if it's debt, how do you get the debt paid back? And the answer, of course, is via the revenues that are generated. So the, the revenue is, is really key to, to getting your um, finance in place. And the revenue is very much in turn dependent on demand for the EV charging points. So in general, if people are using the EV charging points, or if fleets of vehicles of you are using them, buses, taxis, etc., and they're paying to use them, then you've got your revenue flowing through, and then you can model a finance package to um, finance the installation of the charge points and get your repayment and your return via that revenue. So the first two examples that I've got focus on uh, two um, cases, one being electric vehicle charging in the parking lots of supermarkets, and the second one being in for, for taxi fleets. And in both cases, the key focus there is on the revenue. How do we get comfortable that the electric that the charge points will be used and the revenue will be flow be flowing? So starting with the first case study. This is, um, this is based on a, a project that I worked on, and I must dis disclaim that it was with my previous role before I joined Green Giraffe with a bank called Triodos Bank. Um, it is in the public domain. The case study is for, for Tesco, the supermarket chain, um, and I worked on a transaction where we structured a debt package, um, and the debt financed the installation of EV charging points in the parking lots of Tesco supermarkets. So that, that transaction has closed. The, the charge points are going into the supermarket parking lots. If you visit some of Tesco's parking lots, you will find them there. So it has been successful and is rolling out. So the question is, how did we do that? Um, so I'm going to work through a few um, points as to how we managed to achieve that. Um, in, in other words, get a loan to finance the installation of charge points in Tesco supermarkets. A bit of context first, Tesco has over 3,000 supermarkets in the UK. Uh, this project was only tackling the first 400 supermarkets, still a lot. Um, and not, not all of those supermarkets have parking lots, but many of them do, and they have sometimes quite large parking lots. Uh, the, the project is, is scalable, so in the first instance, it's um, installing six charge points per, per selected parking lot. But as you can imagine, a Tesco supermarket uh, has many parking bays and you can scale that up over time and you can draw down further debt to scale it up. The, the charge point provider in that case was Podpoint. It's one of the UK's leading charge point providers, particularly for home charging. Um, and then the finance was structured as a loan uh, where the money goes in up front to pay for the installation and it's paid back over a number of years um, uh, repayments on the loan. I have a few more, a few more general details. The, the, the project was structured as a combination of different charge points. So we didn't stick to one specific type of charge point, but decided a mixture would be better to some diversity. So there are some fast charge points going up to 50 kilowatts and also some slow charge points of around uh, 22 kilowatts. Um, and that was deliberate to cater for uh, customers coming to the Tesco stores and um, maybe needing only a little charge or maybe needing more of a charge, a faster charge, depending how, how, how low their batteries were in the car and how long they were spent at the supermarket. The, the way that we tackled it from a finance perspective was to look at what we've done in the past. And in, in finance of renewable energy, there's two similar uh, types of transactions. One is the finance of rooftop solar panels, and the other one is the finance of smart metering. Um, in both cases, banks have extensively financed the rollout of rooftop solar panels and smart metering. And there's a lot of similarities because 
you have a lot of discrete assets in, in specific locations, often not on their own piece of land, they're on somebody else's piece of land. And the bank has to take security over those discrete assets, but without having necessarily the land rights that go with that. So how, how exactly one does that, it's, um, it's for the lawyers to, to uh, sort out the details, but, but in essence, it is possible. It is possible to structure a debt package and take security, as it's called, over discrete assets spread over many different locations on somebody else's property that does work. And those are the two models that we looked at to structure that. Um, the revenues, as I said before, the revenues were key. So in, the, in this particular case of the supermarkets, how did we get comfortable with the revenues? Uh, there was an element of fixed payment in the structure. I can't disclose uh, too much about it. Um, but there was also an element of revenue from charging of, of um, electric vehicles by the charge points. We looked at a variety of different forecasts for the uptake of electric vehicles in the UK, including National Grid, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. There's a variety of forecasts out there. We did some modeling as to how many people arriving at the Tesco supermarkets would arrive in an electric vehicle, how many people would probably want to charge, um, and how long people would typically spend in the, in the supermarket, assuming they're plugged in their car and charged for the whole time. And that gave us some models as to how much revenue we could expect to generate from the charge points over time. Um, the, there's a few other considerations that I'll go into before we go on to the second case study. Some of them have already been uh, mentioned, so I'll just briefly run through some of them. Other things one has to take into account are obsolescence. So are the charge points that we're putting in, in that case, are those going to be relevant and what the consumer wants for the time that it takes to repay the debt on the charge points? Uh, we decided in that case that it, it, would, it would be okay relative to the debt, but one does have to be careful the capacity of electric vehicles to charge is increasing. They can accept, in general, larger and higher charges uh, over time. So there is an evolution of the charge points themselves. So one does need to take care that one doesn't install old technology that becomes obsolete too quickly. Other, other items have also been mentioned already. We've got warranties. Um, we had to look at the operation and maintenance arrangements, who will actually maintain the charge points. Um, we had to look at insurance. The, the payment system was also a very important one. In this case, the uh, charge point provider Podpoint operates their own payment system, and that worked very well. But certainly it's not a case of just buy a charge point and put it in the ground because somebody has to be maintaining a system where people come along and they plug into the charge point and they can then pay for the charge. A lot of it goes via smartphones nowadays and internet and so on, but that payment system is very critical, of course. So that, uh, that was the first case study I wanted to mention. I've got a second case study as well, and that's um, on taxis. So in the UK, there is a government department called the Office of Low Emission Vehicles, OLEV it's called, and they have a variety of grants available for electric vehicle charging and uh, electric vehicle activities. One of the grants that they made available in recent years is for electrification of taxi fleets in cities in the UK. Uh, the way the grant worked is that cities had to put in an application to receive grant money and describe what they intended to do. And if they were successful, then they would get the grant. But they then, before getting the actual money, had to put together a plan and demonstrate how they were going to implement electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging, and electrify their taxi fleet. So in essence, the, 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 the city that received the grant had to commit to electrifying their taxi fleet, uh, ideally over a period of time, and then design a charging network to service that electri electrification of a taxi fleet. That actually works very well from a finance perspective. And the reason is because the number of taxis in any UK city is generally very well controlled. We generally know how many taxis there are. They're licensed. The, the, the city authorities control the number of licenses and therefore they control the number of taxis. Um, 
we, it's also possible to, in this particular case study, there were actually trackers put in taxis as part of the project to monitor where the taxis went, to how, how long they drove, when they would need to be charged. And if you've got a finite number of taxis and you, and you know they're all going to become electric, you can quite quickly develop a model to say how much charging those taxis will need uh, every day. Typically, the taxis were charging twice a day in that case. The, the, the most, most important key, though, to that one was that not all the taxis went electric instantaneously. Of course, it was over a period of time that the taxis became electric, so the charge points had to be installed over a period of time matching the uptake of the, of the electrification of the taxis. The other important point with this one was the location of the charge points, of course. You want to put those charge points in locations where taxis are typically going to stop and wait and need to charge. Um, but that's also very good from a finance perspective, because if you're financing the first, the first rollout of charge points in the city for taxis and you're getting the best locations, for example, perhaps in front of the central station, by, by key shopping centers, you get in the best locations where most of the taxis stop, well then you've got a pretty solid um, asset in terms of your network of charge points catering for the electrified taxis. So um, that, the, there was one final point to add to that. The condition of OLEV grants for electrification of taxis was that uh, the grants had to be matched by private sector money. So not only uh, public money. And that was the key that allowed, in this case, debt to come in. And the finance was therefore structured as part public grants and part uh, private money being debt, bank debt in that case. Um, and the, and the, the, the most important aspect there is the, the security of revenue and the comfort by which one could get comfortable that the taxis will actually become electric and will be charging and you will get revenue flowing through to pay back the, the finance. I'm nearly done. I have one more uh, case study I want to mention. This is a very brief one. Um, at Green Giraffe, we also worked on one of the largest electric vehicle charging transactions in Europe to date. That was the um, acquisition by a French infrastructure fund called Meridium of a Dutch EV charging company called Elego. Um, that was also bank financed. Elego owns an extensive network of EV charging across Europe. And after acqu acquiring the um, Elego, Meridium raised bank debt and Green Draft did the financial modeling for that uh, transaction. Uh, that's the, those are my three case studies. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you, hope you enjoyed that. Thanks, Sterling. Those were really good case studies. Good to get some insight from uh, you know, somebody who's been doing some pretty um, significant transactions in the EV sector. Um, could we have another poll question whilst we gear up for Stefan Barrow from MUFG? Steffi, you ready? Uh, I think so, James. I'll just uh, fire, fire up the system. So, thanks very much. Um, so I think those have been all really uh, very interesting examples of how the, the, the space is developing. Um, and from, from my side, I'm, I'm Stefan Barrow. I'm a, a director uh, within the project finance team at uh, MUFG Bank. We're one of the largest investors in uh, infrastructure across the globe, uh, both in the, the sort of traditional infrastructure space and also uh, in relation to renewables in, in particular. Um, and we've been monitoring the, the, the growth of the, the, the EV charging sector very closely for, for the last two years. I think we always try and position ourselves um, at the forefront of, of things that are, are, are going to change and develop and ultimately we position ourselves where our clients are going to go. And I think we can certainly see that uh, EV charging is, is definitely going to be uh, part of, 
of the evolution of, of digital infrastructure more broadly and, and perhaps the convergence of um, uh, energy transition across the grid more, more generally. I think what we've looked at so far have been some very interesting uh, individual approaches to, to, to getting EV charging in from off, off the ground. And I think I just wanted to take a little bit of a step back and look more broadly at what else has been happening across the piece uh, across Europe, just to give uh, a little bit more of a, a sense of how things are developing. Uh, and then just touch on some of the, 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 the business models that we're starting to see uh, developing uh, within the space uh, and just briefly touch on some of the bankability issues that, that, that track off the back of that, although in fairness, uh, my colleagues have already touched on, on, on most of those. So I think the, the sort of first theme or the larger observation in relation to this is that in any new sector, it takes some time to get that, that traction. I think Sterling touched on the point that we're in a really good place in the UK and that we've had lots of different sectors develop over time and it's really a question of borrowing some of the architecture from those um, those sectors to, to, to bring something together to, to make it work. Uh, if you'd looked at uh, offshore wind 10, 15 years ago, uh, people would have laughed at you if you'd said that you could you could get these deals financed and yet, you know, the, 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 they're financed all the time now and, and massively overcommitted in terms of um, the amount of debt that's available. It's just a question of how you go about building the architecture to enable that that to happen so i i think it, it is going to be a, a slow evolution um i think it, it will take some time to go from the the, the smaller projects to, to the larger projects that, that are enable you to attract perhaps um larger amounts of debt and i'll just pick up on, on some of the themes as to, to to why that's the case now just looking um more broadly i think in the time that we've been tracking the space, so we, we, we started really the back end of 2017, 2018, just monitoring all the different players that were were active uh, in the EV charging arena and trying to see who, who was doing what, what the business models were, how, how people were going about things. Uh, and I think two things have struck us uh, over that period of time. One is we've definitely moved from uh, a position of this may happen to this is definitely going to happen to this is happening. And I think one of the, the, the metrics that we track is just how many vehicles there are that are el eligible for the UK uh, EV home charging scheme. And I think in, in 2018, there were 59 vehicles, um, 49 cars, nine vans, and, and, and one taxi uh, that were eligible for the scheme. And to be fair, some of those were, were plug-in hybr hybrids and, and not just pure electric vehicles. And if you, you fast forward two years, that's now doubled. So there is definitely a lot more available and there's no shortage of a willingness for uptake on the consumer side, but it is going to take quite some time, I think, for that to, to broaden through. Um, but I think in terms of the push, that, that is now very much underway. I think the other thing that we noticed when we, we started looking at the, the charge points operators that are operating in the space is that they, they are all still very small. And that stands to reason because this is very, very much a developing industry. So if you look at their, their, their balance sheets and their revenues, they are still very modest and there are a lot of them. There's a lot more of them than, than you would think. And I think what we anticipated was, was going to happen was there was going to be some, some level of consolidation required and certainly some interest from uh, the broader energy and utility companies to dip their turn into the space and, and, and try and get themselves a footprint as you see the, the world moving towards a, a, a greener, a greener agenda. And, and that has by and large been the case. So I think in the last Three years, we've tracked 44 rod transactions that have that have happened in in in, in, in the broader area. Some of those have been uh, M&A. Some of them have been the, the very clever and innovative finan financing schemes that, that Joe and Sterling uh, referenced. But there is definitely a, a lot happening. And I think if we look down um, the, the list of transactions that, that, that we've monitored, you know, every every energy company in one form or another is is making a play into the space. So BP have acquired ChargeMaster. Shall have acquired New Motion and, and Green Lots in the States. And now the Italian energy company have acquired eMotor Works. Uh, Angie have acquired EVBox. Uh, Energy have entered into JV with uh, DKV in Germany. EDF acquired Podpoint. Uh, and Total have acquired uh, G2 Mobility in, in France. So you can see that there's very much a strategic play underway in terms of those companies looking to, to secure uh, EV charging capacity and, and, and technology. We initially thought that that might be uh, some some form of a defensive play from from the energy companies, but I think increasingly 
we're confident that that's for them a very important part of the, the, the new energy footprint that they'll be looking towards going forwards. The other interesting aspect that we've seen in and amongst all of that is you are starting to see infra funds dipping their toes into, into the, the arena. Uh, Joe's obviously covered uh, Amber's involvement in the space and Sterling touched on uh, Meridian's, Meridian's acquisition of, of Alago. You've also had 3i uh, acquiring green flux uh, late last year in, in the Netherlands and Infra Capital have uh, acquired Fortum Recharge in, in the Nordics. And what's very interesting about all of those players is that they tend to be at the forefront of, of new developments where they, they see an opportunity, they, they like to go in early uh, with a long-term view and, and, and d develop it on that basis. And Infra Capital is a good example of that. Um, smart metering, for example, they, they were one of the first investors in in the metering space uh, right at, at its very beginning. So it, it, it is definitely starting to develop. Now, I think the theme that we, we pick up on, on the back of that is, is trying to understand a, a little bit more around how these businesses um, are, are going about building their, their revenue models. And certainly I think having the larger players behind them gives them a bit more capacity and ability to, to, to grow. Um, but it's not clear yet to us um, which type of business model is, is ultimately going to be successful. And I think that there's going to be lots of different approaches to this. I, I think Sterling touched um, very clearly on how, uh, you know, you can craft a solution for a particular environment. And, and I, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. We are, we are seeing a, a broad divergence, if you like, between those that are, are leaning into a, a sort of asset light model and those that are leaning into an, an asset heavy model. So the asset light players are looking to effectively fund the, the, the installation of the charge point infrastructure themselves uh, and then offer it as a, as a service effectively um, to, to, to the end customers. So they, they don't want to own the assets ultimately. It's, it's effectively providing a service piece of infrastructure. Um, and, and on the other hand, you've got those looking at a more asset heavy model where they are very keen to be the owners of the infrastructure, but focusing very critically as to where they are positioned, uh, almost like a, a, a land grab and looking to, to secure the most a, a attractive charging footprints uh, wherever they, they, they may be. Now, I think, you know, those two models may, may both develop very well together. There might be a, a preference for, for one or the other, but I think it's the first time that we're we're starting to see um, a, a clear divergence in, in, in that regard. I think the other element that, that comes through in a lot of this, and which is one of the things that makes it quite difficult from a, an infrastructure lender perspective, is just the importance of the software platform in a, a lot of these um, uh, charging operator businesses. I think that's something as infra lenders we've We've not been particularly familiar with in the past and i think getting our heads around what what that means within a business and you know where is the where is the infrastructure like characteristics in relation to that is is something that um we still need to do a little bit of work in relation to but there's no doubt that uh, a, a lot a lot of companies are seeing the real value in the, in that side of things uh so for example centrica invested in an israeli ev business called drives which focuses primarily on developing that, that sort of software platform, um, which is a, a sort of critical element if you, you look at uh, you know, creating an, an, an open access platform uh, across the UK. So I think with, with that in mind, from, a, from a, a lending perspective, I think James touched very clearly on, on a number of the, the, the risk allocation elements in relation to the, the sort of broader bankability issues. I think for, for us, we see, we see these boiling down into to, to two broad camps, if you like. Um, you, you can either have projects that are, are very bespoke and tailored to an individual solution, which um, may have typical, I'm not sure if we're still allowed to say this, P PPP type characteristics where you have some sort of uh, availability type payment that, that, that allows you to, to get some comfort that there is a, a, a revenue flow and then a proper allocation of risk that follows. Or on the other side, you may have what we think of now as our sort of hybrid infrastructure model, whereby you have uh, companies operating on a, on a quasi-monopolistic basis that create an operating model which, which has effectively high barriers to entry uh, in, in, in one form or another and very sticky revenues um, as, as a result. 
and I think we've seen that type of, of, of model develop um, a, a lot over the last 10 years in, in the infrastructure space more broadly. I think it's something that certainly underpins uh, a lot of the fiber broadband rollout deals that, that, that we see in the UK and across Europe more, more broadly. But I think in this space, uh, it's something that's going to take a little bit more time to, to develop. It's not something that can, that can happen in, in, in a hurry. Uh, there is a, a long way to go in terms of laying down uh, a, a baseline revenue model and approach that, that allows you to, to look at these businesses businesses in, in, in that sort of way. So I think the, the scale is, is definitely something that uh, will prove to be a, a challenge in, into the, the short term, certainly for um, larger lending opportunities in, in, in the space. And I, I think there will be a lot more of the, the, the innovative, innovative um, funding solutions that you've, you've seen uh, Joe and, and, and Sterling talk to this morning. So James, that, that, that was just a, a brief canter through, um, through, through, through my thoughts on, on the sector at the moment. Thanks, Steph. That's uh, really very interesting. Um, we've had a few questions come in. Uh, I'm conscious of time, but maybe we just give it five minutes to uh, just for canter through those. Maybe the other panellists can come back on. Um, oh, the first one's interesting. Uh, I've got a good view of Sterling's keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of us drive EVs? Confession time, I don't know. No, not yet. Anything to save yet. us, Joe? <laughs> yes. Sterling? No, no, I, I actually have a bicycle, so. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's, um, saves us, kind of. Um, moving on swiftly, anyway. Um, uh, Joe, I'm, I'm a Meef. MEEF's only in London, isn't it? And there's a question as to whether you can access MEEF funding for outside of London. I'm afraid not, no. MEEF um, funding has to fund assets within London or an SME that is um, headquartered in London. Um, Amber does have another fund, um, Spruce, um, which is a similar fund seeded with ERDF monies um, in Scotland that can fund similar projects um, across Scotland. But no, unfortunately not at the moment. But I mean, it struck me one of the key things about um, MEF is it was leveraging money from the mayor to, to get in private capital to, to basically get more cash together. It seems to me that should be something which is capable of being replicated elsewhere. Do you have a view on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. That's, to be honest, why I wanted to flag it today. Um, one of the key drivers for the GLA was is, was that leveraging in more money. So as part of the procurement, we were asked to actually crowd in over 260 million. We actually managed to get um, commitments for up to 500 million. So the banks are keen to fund these projects. And I think what's great about using a MEF type vehicle is that to a degree, we do quite a lot of the early heavy lifting and they can sit there in the wings and then once we've found a project that we think that they're keen to fund, we can then go out to the banks. It also obviously from a GLA perspective means that their money goes much further because we have to match pound for pound. But if we could, we could even overmatch with more private sector money to the public sector. Okay, thank so you. Very happy to follow up with anyone else who's keen to implement a MIF type fund. Thanks, Joe. Um, I've had a question as whether hydrogen is a genuine competitor to private cars. I, I think, from my perspective, it's not something I've looked at in earnest. I, I, I'm aware that there some people are, are perhaps, uh, given the current um, issues with China, some people are saying, well, look, all these batteries are made in China. Should we be making, mm. uh, investing in a different solution? Um, I guess, um, in terms of technology, uh, EVs are a long way ahead of hydrogen. I don't know if anybody else has any experience with hydrogen vehicles. Um, I can maybe make a few comments. My understanding was that uh, hydrogen vehicles were becoming quite popular in the in the Far East, in Japan, I think, particularly. Yeah. Um, but I think in, in in certainly across Europe and the UK, uh, you're, you're hard pressed to really find. Um, <clears throat> pockets where hydrogen is hydrogen vehicles are being um, uh, are really competing with electric vehicles at this stage. J J James, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that. I think um, in, in Japan, for example, they've done quite a lot of work around hydrogen fuel cells. So they, uh, a lot of the Japanese motor vehicle manufacturers have been 
sort of hedging their bets that, that, that hydrogen may make a comeback. Um, I, I think more broadly, it, it's probably a case of you, you, you don't need to have one at the exclusion of the other. I think if you're looking to have more of a hydrogen vehicle solution, you need to have a, a broader push into the hydrogen economy more generally that, that sort of sits behind it. And maybe um, out into the medium term, in the same way you have petrol and diesel, you have EV and, 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 and hydrogen. I, I don't think at this stage it'd necessarily be one or the other. I think EV is probably ahead in, in the race at the moment, but I, I wouldn't rule hydrogen out. Uh, as as a, a viable alternative in the medium term. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe just one more question. Um, do you have a view on Brexit risk for EV financing in the UK? Bit of a googly. Um, Steph, <laughs> you're the banker. You've got on to mute. Uh, sorry, I was, I was hoping to stay on mute. <laughs> 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 um, not, not specifically. I, I, I think the, the answer is um, like every set of challenges presented to the finance markets um, or to, to UK industry more generally, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way around it. Um, uh, I, I don't have a, a short-term view as to whether or not there's going to be um, – uh, an immediate impact. It feels to me like there are probably broader comments to be made around um, how, how COVID has, you know, posed a, a tremendous burden to the Treasury more generally, and does that impact the speed at which other capital becomes available for for developing EV more, more generally? Um, would be my initial thoughts. Any other any comments from panelists? Uh, I tend to agree with Steph. I think it's all about um, the impact of COVID, to be perfectly honest, on pots of capital at the moment and whether, I mean, I, I certainly can see whilst everybody is focused on an, a green recovery, you can see that there are so many calls on constrained capital resources. Um, so it will be interesting to see where, where the capital goes. Yeah, mm. and I, su I suppose the, you don't get away from the fundamental issues. Though. I mean, Brexit aside, this is still a big demand risk issue um, with, with EVs. And I think there has been talk perhaps of a scrappage scheme, which may assist in getting more EVs out on the road. And I may even buy one, uh, given I've got a rotting yeah. in my garage. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think the demand risk is still the, 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 the mm. fundamental issue here. Sorry, Sterling. Um, yeah. Yes, maybe I would add one more dimension to it. I think in the infrastructure space in particular, the last six months have been quite um, eye-opening as to where risk really lies. And um, some of the traditional infrastructure assets um, and investments of past years uh, have proven not to be quite as low risk as one would have thought. So I'm thinking airports, ports, um, uh, perhaps toll roads, student accommodation, um, types of real estate, city centre, office, sky rises, a lot of these things just, um, well, are not generating the revenues that one always assumed they would be in coronavirus times. So maybe relatively EV charging portfolios um, could, relative to other types of infrastructure, could, could benefit as being seen to be um, potentially uh, a more competitive palais. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think for the very traditional infrastructure assets, as opposed to those that have kind of snuck in over recent years, I think have shown themselves to be more resilient, haven't they, over the past six months or so? Yes. Okay. Okay, well, that's, that's great. I think I'm, I'll draw a line under it there because I'm conscious that we, we are almost 10 minutes over time. Uh, we will circulate slides and a recording of the video to everybody and also answers to the questions and the uh, answers to the poll. But thanks everybody for joining. And uh, there will be another webinar uh, coming up in the autumn. So please uh, look out for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.